we go. So um, this is kind of a big deal. Everybody's talking about your your review. So um, just to set the stage, could you briefly summarize what is the serotonin hypothesis of depression, uh, which is quite a few decades old, and how it became so influential? Yeah, so the serotonin hypothesis was first proposed in the 1960s, and it is the idea that depression is due to a deficiency of serotonin in the brain. And the hypothesis became, um, was popularized in the 1990s by the pharmaceutical industry when it introduced a line of antidepressants, the SSRIs, that are thought that 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 reduce that that sorry that that increase serotonin levels and were therefore thought to work by rectifying the underlying serotonin imbalance that was proposed by the serotonin theory of depression. So the SSRIs were brought in, were developed on the basis of the serotonin theory of depression, and they were believed to work in the way that the serotonin theory predicted. And so from the 1990s onwards, there was this huge marketing campaign which marketed the SSRIs very much in conjunction with this idea that what they were doing was rectifying an underlying serotonin deficiency, boosting your serotonin levels. There were lots of advertisements, direct-to-consumer advertisements in the United States, um, putting across that message, uh, and there were online uh, websites run by the pharmaceutical industry that also put that message across that were available to everyone you know in different countries and so people came to uh, came to hear and, and came to believe that depression was caused by low serotonin and that this could be put right by an anti that, that, that this problem that this brain abnormality could be corrected by an antidepressant there was also a big campaign, a marketing campaign directed at doctors. So doctors were also given the same message at the same time as being, you know, directly encouraged to um, to prescribe these antidepressants. Um, this is what so, most people know as the chemical imbalance theory. Yes, uh, yes Most exactly. people refer to it as a chemical imbalance in the brain. Yes, yes. And, and, and it was referred to as a chemical imbalance in a lot of the marketing uh, in the 1990s. So, but it seems that there were already doubts about this, the validity of this hypothesis ever, ever since it started. And there, are, there has been previous studies and previous reviews um, checking the validity of this hypothesis and the efficacy of SSRIs, of the antidepressants that were marketed as a solution to the depression based on this theory. So what makes your analysis different and relevant in this case? So, um, so people have been suggesting, uh, at least since 2005, probably a bit earlier than that, that actually uh, the research on serotonin wasn't consistent and, and didn't convincingly support the serotonin hypothesis. So for a long time, there's been that suggestion out there. And when that suggestion was made by a couple of American um, researchers in 2005, some psychiatrists responded by saying, oh, you know, we don't really believe it anyway. Yeah, we don't think there's a simple, it's just a simple chemical imbalance. But, but the message still carried on being promoted to the general public. We had, we've had a couple of doctors on British prime time, on the BBC, or, or, or um, one was on the BBC, one was on ITV, telling the public that depression is due to a chemical imbalance in the last few months, one in the last couple of weeks. Uh, so that the message still continued to be put out to the public. Now, the reason that I wanted to do this research was that there was no paper before ours that really collected together all the research. So people were sort of aware that maybe the studies weren't consistent but no one had really got all the different strands of research on serotonin together and really looked at whether the studies were positive or negative or, or inconsistent or, or what they were saying. So that's what's new about our, our study. We got together all the 
all the different overviews and meta-analyses from all the main areas of serotonin research to in, in order to be able to make a pronouncement on the current state of the evidence for links between serotonin and depression. So um, for most people are not familiar with the terminology. So uh, an umbrella analysis is basically a meta-analysis of meta-analysis. Yes, Am I right? Yes. So, so, um, yeah. so we did an umbrella, an umbrella review, and you're right, it's a meta-analysis of meta-analyses, but we, also, we, we did sort of six umbrella reviews because we actually looked at six major areas, of, uh, six of the major areas of research in serotonin and did a systematic review of all the meta-analyses in those different areas. Yes. Um, what's the total number of cases that um, some of the, the evidence for all the reviews that you took into account for your meta-analysis? So, so we included 17 studies altogether, and the uh, genetic studies were very large. They were using genetic data bank studies. We looked at uh, studies of the serotonin transporter gene, which has been suggested to be associated with depression. So those studies involved tens of thousands of people. The largest one was over 100,000. The non-genetic studies involved uh, a total of uh, around about 6,000, or it might be 7,000 people. I can pop upstairs and check in a minute. Sorry, my paperwork's upstairs. <laughs> no, it's fine because it's not a small exactly. number of cases. Yeah. It's yeah. a lot of evidence yeah. that's yeah. accumulated. Also, um, like you said, you took a look at um, to some examples that were particularly useful in disproving this serotonin hypothesis. One of them was the, the genetic studies and the other one was the tryptophan depletion studies. So can you go a little bit more into detail mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. what were these cases that ultimately gave you a counter um, counter example to the, the evidence that was presented as um, part of the uh, serotonin hypothesis. Yeah, so the tryptophan depletion studies are experiments that have been conducted for the last 30 years, which give people a special amino acid drink, which is meant to lower levels of serotonin. I should just qualify that by saying that it probably lowers levels of serotonin, but it may do some other things. So people are not totally certain, you know, whether this is a pure measure of lowering serotonin. Anyway, that, that's the idea, that's the theory. And uh, this drink is given to volunteers who are not depressed. Uh, and then their mood is measured afterwards, a few hours afterwards when, when serotonin is meant to be at its lowest levels. So the idea was that, uh, that, that this method of, it's called tryptophan depletion, this method of lowering serotonin would induce depression in people who didn't have it. But, those studies don't show that. The, the, the studies with volunteers um, uh, sh show, show that, there's no that there's no effect on mood, that there's no lowering of mood. Um, the, there was, the last meta-analysis was, was done in 2007, and there was a small effect in people who had a family history, a, a very small sample of people who had a family history of depression. But, but overall, there was no effect in volunteers. And then we looked, because that measure analysis was done so long ago, we looked at the, the last 10 trials that had, had been published on this in December 2020 when we did the searches, and none of those showed any effect in volunteers either. So there's, there's quite a lot of data that shows that serotonin, serotonin, lowering serotonin through this tryptophan depletion method does not cause depression. Are there examples to the country that people with high serotonin levels are nevertheless, with very high serotonin levels are nevertheless depressed? Uh, so, so we looked at ser the serotonin receptors and mm -hmm. we looked at uh, studies that have been done on the serotonin transporter. That's the protein that removes serotonin from the nerve synapses where it's active. And both of those um, both of those areas of research sh showed very inconsistent and weak findings. So they looked at different areas of the brain using brain imaging techniques. And in some areas of the brain, they found lower levels of serotonin receptors, for example, and lower levels of the serotonin transporter. Uh, but in some, they didn't. 
but um, lower levels of the serotonin transporter would actually imply higher levels of active serotonin because the serotonin transporter removes serotonin from the place where it has its action. And the, the receptors that people have looked at have also been autoreceptors, so those are inhibitory receptors. So lower levels of inhibitory receptors would also imply overactivity of serotonin. However, as I said, the results were fairly inconsistent. And also a lot of the majority of people in those studies or a lot of people in those studies um, were using or had used antidepressants. So I think it's quite likely that those results may be an indication of, of um, carryover effects of, of antidepressants. Um, so, so just to mention that the, the genetic studies, because these were, you know, these were probably the most compelling, convincing Evidence. area that, that we looked at because they involved tens of thousands of people. And what was really interesting is that some of the early meta-analyses suggested there might be a link between um, depression and, uh, and um, the, the serotonin tran transporter gene. Then, then as time went on and more meta-analyses were, were done, it seemed that actually that effect didn't exist. So then people suggested that maybe it wasn't a, a straightforward association, but maybe there was an interaction between adverse life events and the serotonin transporter gene and depression. So people looked at that. And again, some of the early analyses suggested maybe there was a, an interaction effect, but the later ones showed no evidence of an interaction effect. And the later studies were the bigger studies and the better studies. So the genetic research was really a very good example of how when you get bigger and better quality studies, actually these small effects that sometimes turn up in smaller studies were nullified, were, you know, were found just to be an artifact of the way that, that research is reported or you know, maybe selective, selective publication findings. And the other really interesting thing about the genetic studies is that even though there was no, they, they did show no interaction between adverse life events and the gene, the serotonin transporter gene and depression, what they did show was a very strong effect of adverse life events. Adverse life events had a very strong predictive effect on your later chance of having depression. So that, but that, those are the unrelated to serotonin. Unrelated to the gene, yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Regarding antidepressants in SSRIs in particular, um, there's also been a controversy about the efficacy of these drugs for, for a very long time. And the fact is that some people report to having improvements in their depression symptoms. But um, would you say that they may work in a different way that we are not aware of, or that like other studies have found, the results can be attributed to the placebo effect? In fact, there are some studies that you cite where antidepressants of this kind are not more effective than the placebo. So, so the, the, the research on which the use of antidepressants is based consists of placebo control trials that compare antidepressants with an inactive sugar pill or chalk tablet uh, called a placebo. And what they find is that there is, if you put them all together and you add in the ones that haven't been published, there's a very small difference um, showing that antidepressants are, antidepressants are just a little bit better than a placebo pill. But the, but the difference is very small. It's about two points um, on a on a 52 point rating scale and people have suggested including myself but other people too have suggested that maybe this difference is not actually large enough to be clinically relevant or important or even to be noticeable in fact there's some research that suggests that that level of difference wouldn't actually even really be noticeable um, to to uh, observers making a, a sort of estimate of how how someone is doing um, and and what I think is important about the research that we've done is that it shows that you can't explain that difference between antidepressants and placebo on the basis of there being antidepressants having, uh, having an effect by targeting the underlying biological mechanisms that produce depression or depressive symptoms. A lot of people, a lot of psychiatrists seem to assume that that must be the case, that that is the only way that antidepressants could show a difference from placebo. That's the only way that antidepressants could work. But that's not true. 
there are other ways that they could work, that they could have effects. Um, one way is that they probably have an active placebo effect, and sorry, an amplified placebo effect. So people in these randomized trials can often tell whether they're taking the active drug or the placebo. And we know that people's um, uh, expectation, people's perceptions of what they're taking can influence their outcome because people um, are hopeful about the effects of taking an active substance. So the difference might be explained by amplified placebo effects. It also may be explained by the fact that antidepressants are they are active drugs. They do produce, they, we don't have evidence that they are rectifying an underlying chemical imbalance, but we do know that they change brain chemistry in some way, in, in, in various ways. And they, they have mental and behavioral effects as a consequence of changing normal brain chemistry. And one of the mental effects they seem to have that's often reported is, is a, 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 an emotional numbing effect people say report that their emotions are less intense, both their negative emotions, but also their positive emotions like happiness and joy. Um, so that's the other way that antidepressants may be producing this slight difference from placebo that we see when we do placebo controlled trials. But the important point is that if antidepressants are working through amplified placebo effects or through emotional numbing, and they're doing that because they change the, the normal state of the brain. That's a very different state of affairs than if they are working to cor by correcting some underlying abnormality. And people might make, I would suggest, very different decisions if they were told that that's what antidepressants were doing, rather than being given the message that they were uh, working by by correcting some underlying abnormality. If you've got an, you know, if you've got a brain abnormality and you're told this drug can put it right, obviously it makes sense to take it. It would be it would be foolish not to take it. As it, you know, if you're a diabetic and you need insulin, your insulin's very low. You you take insulin. Um, but if you're presented with a drug and told actually this is changing your normal brain chemistry and we don't quite know what it's doing, but it might numb you a bit, that's a different a different um situation just to make an analogy it would be like uh, going to the doctor because you broke your arm and the doctor giving you a painkiller but not putting it in cast so basically it would be um an example of a drug that only affects even slightly the symptoms of the condition but not the cause of the condition itself y yes but it's a bit worse than that because um because at least the painkiller would would work on the pain by by working on the pain mechanisms, you know, the biological mechanisms that produce pain. Whereas the antidepressants, as far as we know, we cannot say that they are working on the biological mechanisms that produce the symptoms of depression. Even so, you know, I think it's even even worse than the painkiller situation. Although obviously. You don't just want painkillers if you've broken your arm. <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> but you also want the cast and, yeah, and yes, you yes. want your arm to get healed as soon as possible. Yes. So um, these drugs, antidepressants and SSRIs, which are the most popular, are driving huge revenues for pharmaceutical companies. And there seems to be um, quite a few studies where there are clear conflicts of interest because they have been funded by these companies. How did you proceed when you encounter those studies for your review? Ooh, um, do, do you know, I think most of the meta-analyses we looked at were not funded. I'm not sure that any of them were. Um, the, the, the pharmaceutical industry have funded almost all the trials of antidepressants, or I, prob probably around about 90% of trials of antidepressants that have ever been done have been funded by, by the pharmaceutical industry. Um, but these study and they and they've certainly funded some of the studies of serotonin, some of the individual studies, um, and uh, and and that may well have had an impact. You know, there there are all these problems of selective reporting and selective publication that are are um, probably much worse among pharmaceutical company um, produced research, pharmaceutical uh, research. Um, but the meta-analyses themselves weren't, weren't done by the pharmaceutical industry. 
Uh, I mean, it's very interesting how I would say how, you know, that this, this came from the pharmaceutical industry, but it, it, it sort of generalized, you know, the, the, I mean, the pharmaceutical industry is not even that interested in antidepressants anymore. And yet people are still being told that it's a chemical imbalance. Um, and, and it's just become a cultural idea, hasn't it? A cultural belief. Uh, it that, is. That, that depression is a chemical imbalance. It, it all stems from that marketing in the 1990s, but it just developed a life of its own, this, this idea. Um, and, and a lot of, so a lot of the research was, was done by, was not done by pharmaceutical companies, although it may well have been done by people who had connections with them, had links with them. Um, but, but the point is that all this pharmaceutical marketing and interest stimulated interest in the, the rest of the research community, which then started doing lots of research to try and look for serotonin abnormalities. Actually, that's the subject of my next question, because, um, well, that, that's obviously a matter of opinion, but would you say that there, are, there has been some societal and economic changes in the past decades that have driven demand for antidepressants both by patients and by doctors? For instance, the, the, um, the fact that people usually demand a drug to treat their conditions instead of other interventions that are non-pharmaceutical like psychotherapy they want to take a pill and get cured you think there's a, some of the marketing was successful in instilling that idea in people and that's what what people are demanding right now yeah 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 no de definitely i think there's um like i say there's the marketing succeed succeeded in producing a cultural shift which changed the way that people think about their their emotions and, and, and made people think that, you know, you know unwelcome emotions and, and unpleasant emotions are something that needs to be treated, that needs to be drugged away, um, got rid of. Um, whether this was new is an interesting question because in the mid 20th century, people were taking a lot of barbiturates and a lot of benzodiazepines. So there was still a lot of use of drugs for mental health problems. It used to be called neurosis, you know, neurosis and anxiety rather than depression, but it probably encompassed a lot of the same sort of problems that, that antidepressants are prescribed for today. But the slight difference, I would say, is that there wasn't an understanding then that it was due to a chemical imbalance. And people were, I think, more aware that what they were taking was something that was going to sedate them and subdue them that was going to numb their feelings rather than resolve anything. Um, people still wanted, you know, people still took the drugs in quite large numbers. Um, but but I, think, I, I think they probably had a better understanding of what they were actually doing than, than people have today because of this, you know, propagation of this idea of the chemical imbalance. Uh, what's, what would you say is the foreseeable horizon for this situation to change? Obviously, once the science has agreed on, on a particular outcome, it takes some time to percolate yeah. into society and even in the medical community. How long do you think it's going to take for doctors to decide that this is not worth their, their effort and, and the patient's well, money? I I think a lot of doctors don't want to don't want to change. And so what they've said is, oh, well, it's not a simple serotonin deficiency, but it's it, serotonin is probably involved and it's some other sort of biological problem, um, which it might be, but it might not be. There is no proof of that. You know, the one the one clear hypothesis about an, un, an underlying abnormality that the drugs might be correcting has been shown not to be true. And saying that there is some complicated situation where you know serotonin's involved in some other things and involved in all these sort of interacting neural networks is not a hypothesis. It's not a testable theory, so it's meaningless. But that's it's what, not science. It's magical it's not thinking. Not science. Basically. No, exactly. And it's really just saying the brain is involved. Well, yeah, we would all agree yeah, well. the brain is involved. <laughs> um, 
but uh, but but what worries me is I think that indicates that the doctors really don't want to they they don't want to understand the implications of this. They want to carry on with business as usual, and they may hopefully they will stop telling patients that they have a chemical imbalance. But I think they will carry on implying to patients that what the drugs are doing is rectifying some unknown underlying biological mechanism rather than telling them that actually there are other explanations for what these drugs might be doing and we have no proof that there is any biological mechanism they are working on. Would you like to comment on emergent therapies like psychedel psychedelic therapy for the treatment of depression? Do you have an opinion on that? <laughs> Um, yes, I do. I do. I've written a blog on that. I'll send. I'll send you the blog actually. If, if you're oh, please do. Yeah, 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 yeah. So what I think is, um, psychedelics are obviously mind-changing drugs, um, and they, uh, you know, they give you a psychedelic experience. Um, and some people may find that psychedelic experience gives them them some insights into their lives, which might be useful. Some people, on the other hand, don't get on well with psychedelics at all and might find the experience really quite frightening. So I think it's a very individual thing. I think some people might get something out of psychedelics. But what really worries me is a creeping tendency to present them in the same way that antidepressants are presented, to present them as something that you take regularly and that somehow switches back something in the brain that's gone wrong which is nonsense, it's totally unsubstantiated, but is obviously useful if you're trying to market a treatment because marketing a treatment that you have once or twice, you know, an experience that you have once or twice is not very profitable. So, you know, all these companies that are pushing psychedelics really want people to be coming back for them on an ongoing basis, like you take antidepressants every day, maybe not every day, but like all the ketamine clinics in the United States, you know, you have them you have it once a week or once a month but you know there are lots of people just having this ketamine on a long-term basis now um and and i'm sure that's what the psychedelic industry is is aiming for uh and and that worries me that worries me because that's just uh you know it's just selling another another unsubstantiated magic pill for depression although that's not the direction that the research started because no, um, no, it's not. Trials no. are just a single session, a single dose, yes. and yes. and it, symptoms improve from there. Yeah, and 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 there were a lot of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy trials. So that's the other thing that worries me is the psychotherapy is being is being forgotten about. Um, mm -hmm. you, you know, it is gradually being um, just left out because obviously that's quite expensive as well, and you're just left with with the psychedelics. And uh, you know, I, I think if it is going to be if a psychedelic is, experience is going to be helpful and not going to be frightening as well and, and negative, then then you do need someone to help you process it. Yeah, you need the therapy to go with, along with it, otherwise yeah. it's yeah. not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. so I, you know, I think there are some interesting ideas in there, but it, the tendency is worrying me because the tendency is, is starting, I think, to present them as if they're just a regular routine treatment, just like antidepressants are really. Um, I think we're going to leave it there. So thank okay. you so much for, okay. for talking to us today.